All right, this is section 1.7. It's called Loss of Significance Errors. And what I want to talk to you about in this section is going to require you to have your graphing calculator with you. So if you don't have that with you already, go ahead and pause the recording and grab that before you go on. And what we're going to take a look at is we're going to like to take a look at some issues that your calculator can have as it tries to approximate these infinity limits that we were looking at in section 1.5. All right, so kind of a preliminary as a why this is important. Um, our world actually um, changes a lot with technology, and there are some things that, because of technology, we sort of reassess whether certain features are necessary to do. And in our world today, some people don't think it's really all that necessary to understand certain aspects of mathematics. Um, and part of this belief comes from the idea that the calculators and computers we use can do a lot of the things that in the past we couldn't do by hand, um, and so, or that we could do by hand, but they were very cumbersome. So what I would like for us to look at in this section is that there are mathematical situations where our technology simply doesn't work right. And a lot of that has to do with this idea in this particular section, what we're going to look at anyway, is the idea of, of looking at, at things as they get infinitely large or infinitely small. That is to say, in the language we've been using, our limits as we approach positive and negative infinity. So the first one I want us to take a look at is I want, to take us, I want us to take a look at this limit uh, of this particular function x um, times the square root of 4x squared plus 1 and then plus the 2x. And we're going to take a look at this limit as x approaches negative infinity. So the first thing that I'd like for you to do is to take a look at this graphically. So if we were to take a look at this graphically in your calculator, and depending on what kind of a view that you would get, and that is to say how far out you go, um, how far negative, because this actually says we're supposed to be looking at the negative values, uh, it's going to look like it bounces up and down a whole lot and gets some streaky, really large values, and, and at some point it just does something weird. I mean, just, it, you can almost tell nothing by this particular graph, so it isn't particularly helpful. The other thing we can take a look at is we can take a look at what happens numerically. Now, in looking at this, what happens numerically, what I'm going to take a look at actually is what happens as those x values get infinitely small, that is to say, as they approach negative infinity. So if we put in, and we'll, we're going to start just with negative 10, and we're going to increase this each time by a power of 10. So I'm looking at powers of 10. So there's negative 1,000. We have 10,000, 100,000. Uh, and we'll go to, we'll do a million. And we'll do one more at 10, negative 10 million. So you would think that whatever happens, if it's going to actually approach a number, that all of these values would eventually sort of show that it's approaching that number. So let's call this equation f of x, so that I can label my column a little bit more concisely. And if you take a look inside your calculator, these are the kind of values you're going to see. So when you plug in negative 10, you're going to get negative 0.249844. Okay, so awfully close to negative 0.25. And if you put in negative 100, you're going to get negative 0.249998, even closer to negative 0.25. If you put in negative 1,000, you actually get negative 0.25. At 10,000, you get negative 0.25. And at negative 100,000, you get negative 0.25. So you might be led to think, hey, this has a limit of negative 0.25 until you get to the next value and then you start to wonder if maybe something weird is going on because all of a sudden when you put in negative a million you're going to get negative 0.2 and if you put in negative 10 million you get the number zero but that sort of seems odd right if this limit approaches zero why did all of those other ones seem to be getting close to the negative 0.25 this is weird so what's really happening? Well, in your calculator, there are actually limitations to the size of the input value, especially the number of input digits. And all devices, calculators, computers, do have a finite memory input. That said, some are having, have a larger memory input than others, but they are all finite. They will only tolerate so many input values. So the question is, what do we do with this information? How do we really find out what's happening? because obviously something weird is happening with this table, but what's the reality? Is the limit 0.25, sorry, negative 0.25, or is the limit zero? Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually rewrite the function notation, and we're gonna repeat this graphical or numerical limiting process 
And in doing so, we're going to create functions that look more what I'm going to call calm. That at least, that is to say, from the technology standpoint, from the input standpoint on the limit, val limiting uh, sort of abilities of our calculator, they're easier for our calculator to handle. So again, same function that we did before. And what I want to do for right now is I want us to just look at how else could this be rewritten. So we have x times the square root of 4x squared plus 1 plus 2x. Now, this doesn't look like a fraction, but I'm going to make it look like one. Uh, and the reason I'm going to do that is because I actually, um, actually, you know what, let me just pause for a moment and talk about this. Uh, when I'm plugging in values that get very, very large and negative, notice it's fine underneath the square root because I'm squaring them. So what ends up happening is out of this, it actually, I'm actually getting a positive infinity, right? At least, at least approached its positive infinity. And this piece right here is approaching negative infinity, which means this whole piece here is approaching zero because I have infinity minus negative minus infinity, or at least we think that it looks something like that. So this piece sort of looks like it's approaching zero, and this piece is approaching negative infinity. So when you try to in, sort of multiply infinity times zero, you don't know what's happening. Which one's getting bigger or smaller faster? So let's take a look back at that original function. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to do that rationalization procedure that we did back in section 1.4. So we're going to multiply 4x squared plus 1 underneath the radical and that negative 2x because this is what we call the conjugate, if you'll remember. And then we did this as 4x squared plus 1. Actually, this was in section 2, 3 now that I'm remembering to the minus 2x. All right, so we're going to simplify this then. Um, if we simplify this just like we did in the last time, I don't really want to multiply the x through. That's not the point. So I'm going to leave the x on the outside. But as I distribute, I actually have a difference of squares. So I can multiply these two together and get the 4x squared plus 1. And then I can multiply my outside terms, to, or my last terms together, and I'll actually get negative 4x squared. Now, if I were to try to do the inner terms or the outer terms, those are going to give me the same value but opposite signs, so they add to 0, if you'll remember that. Now, and then the denominator is actually this, the same value that I'm just multiplying by. So the square root of 4x squared plus 1 underneath the radical and then the minus 2x on the outside. All right, so notice what happens here. This simplifies, this 4x squared is simplified. And I actually now have x on top, and that's it. Just plain old x on top. And then on bottom, I have the square root of 4x squared plus 1 and then minus the 2x. Now what this in effect did is it actually changed what I was doing from in negative infinity, like over here, it was negative infinity times zero. And what this actually still has is now I have that negative infinity on top, but I don't have zero on the bottom. I have other, some other kind of an infinity going on. Now, this is actually sufficient enough that if I put this back in my calculator, it's going to work. So we can repeat this process. So that's we can repeat the graphical or the numerical, depending on what we're asked to do, or both if we needed to, process with this equivalent new function. So with this new equivalent function. that is easier for our calculator to handle. So you might be thinking, you know, so what happens? Well, if you actually plug this into your calculator now, it actually is going to approach that negative 0.25. And if we took a look at our calculator, we would see that happen. It will actually level off on the graph at negative 0.25, and in our function table, it will level off at negative 0.25. It won't have this weird negative 0.2 and 0 uh, cropping up. So I'm actually going to repeat all of this idea now with a couple of more examples. Um, and if you take a look at these uh, directions in your sheet that you're looking at, your homework sheet or this note sheet here,
I've actually got um, more directions written down but sort of crossed out. So this says use graphics and numerics to conjecture a value for the limit. Um, part B that I've crossed out you do not need to do on any of your homework. It talked about finding a way to show uh, the loss of significance error. You can omit doing that. Um, but then we are going to do part C. Part C is going to be to rewrite the function to avoid that error. Now as we take a look, we're just going to do one example because these examples are a little bit involved. That's also partially why we're doing this only part A and part C business. But if you also notice, your homework only has four problems to do, so it's not a significant number of these types of problems. All right, so taking a look at this, I'm going to start with a graphical point of view. So if you look at the graph on this one, um, it actually looks like something anyway, like this. Now the window that I'm using is an unusual window. I'm actually letting my window go up to about a thousand on my y-axis, uh, but I'm only really letting my graph go out to positive and negative two or thereabouts on the x-axis. I've got this negative two a thousand down here as well. So it looks something like this. So it looks like as x approaches zero that we are probably approaching right from both directions. It sort of looks like this, our conjecture might be that this is actually equal to a, a, an infinity kind of a value from this picture. Now let's do it from a numerical standpoint as well. So from a numerical standpoint, I actually have to take into consideration that I need two charts. And the reason I do that is because this actually has two sides to the limit. I have the limit as x approaches 0 from the right, and I have the limit as x approaches 0 from the left. So my x values as it approaches 0 from the left would be something like negative 0.1, negative 0.01, negative 0.001. And I'm going to do a couple more just so that you can see what's actually going to happen here in an interesting way as the number gets very, very close to 0. And we're going to do the other table the same way but with the positive values. This is 0.1. 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, and then 0 0.00001. And I'll give this function, oh, oh, just for fun, we'll call it something different this time. We'll do an exciting g of x. So uh, this will be our function g of x, and our trying to evaluate the function to kind of see what happens. So if we try to plug in that negative 0.1, we actually get 49.999. Uh, and if we do the negative 0.01, we get 5,000. The next one gives me 412,066. So this looks like it's approaching infinity, right? I mean, that's what we guessed that it was in red anyway. But all of a sudden, if you put in negative 0 0.0001, it's going to tell you the function value is 0. And if you kill one, one larger, you're going to get another zero back. Now, because of these um, graphs, that is the graph of cosine up here on top, and the graph of x to the sixth on bottom being even functions, these actually have the ability uh, or have the feature that the same y value occurs whether you put inputs of value that x are positive or negative. So I have the same values over here, 49.99958. I have 5,000. I have 412,066, and then I put zeros in here. So it sort of looks like that the answer should be zero in this table, right? So the graph says it should be infinity. The table says it should be zero. What gives? What's going on? Well, like I said, this is actually part A, right? Conjecture a value for the limit. Well, we actually conjecture two different values. So we're going to do part C then to actually see what's really happening on this graph. That is to say, we're going to change the function in such a way that it's easier for our calculator to sort of tolerate. So this is what our function starts out at. And this idea of conjugate, even though I don't have a square root, is going to come into play again. I'm going to multiply this by 1 plus cosine of x cubed both on top, of course, and on bottom. All right, so just like on the last one, this actually gives me that the inner terms and the outer terms are identical, but opposite signs. Uh, 
So we actually only end up with the first terms multiplied. Of course, that first term multiplied is 1. And then we get the last terms multiplied. So that gives me a negative. And it actually gives me cosine squared of x cubed. I know that looks a little bit awkward, but this is cosine squared of x cubed. I'll put the x cubed in parentheses. Remember, x cubed is the angle measurement. And the denominator, we've got x to the sixth. And we've got that 1 plus cosine of x cubed. All right, so you might recognize, I hope you do. If you don't, it's okay. But you might recognize the top of this function, 1 minus cosine squared. Well, 1 minus cosine squared is the same thing as sine squared. This is actually sine squared of x cubed. And on the bottom, I've got x cubed to the sixth times 1 plus cosine of x cubed. And while this may not look any friendlier, because we've eliminated the subtraction, and now the function is all in terms of addition, it's actually easier, in this case, for our function to be worked with by the calculator. So that if we actually created the table for this one, if we look at the graph, let me make a comment, the graph's actually going to look very much the same. It doesn't look much different. However, the tables are now going to actually reflect what the graph reflects, thus validating the fact that our graph was correct when we originally looked at it. So we're going to do that negative 0 0.1, negative 0 0.01, negative 0 0.001. We'll do three zeros, and then we'll do four zeros. We'll do it for the negatives and for the positives. And you know what? The interesting thing that happens is that if you put this into your calculator, your function in your calculator will actually tell you that the y value at every single one of these x values is 0.5, which was neither one of what we guessed that it would be. And if you validate it with your graph, um, as we did on the last one too, that is to say our graph sort of looked like this, right? I mean, it looked like I should be approaching infinity. And all of a sudden, and, and for a while, my function actually looked like it too. It looked like it should be approaching infinity. But if you take a look at this function that you've simplified and you've worked with in the correct way, you actually find out that this limit of this function, which I call g of x, right? And I'm not going to draw the graph here, but you can certainly look at it in your calculator, is actually going to be 0.5 as well, which was not what we speculated at all. So what I'd like for you to take away from this lesson and doing these four problems I'm going to have you do is that you can't always trust your calculator. It does have limitations. It has limitations on how small an input can be. Take a look at these inputs, right? It has limitations on how large an input can be. That's kind of what we're looking at on the first problem that I sort of set things up with. So the point being that the mathematics that you're learning, these algebra processes for simplification, they actually matter. Your calculator cannot take the place of your brain. It cannot take the place of you being able to reason through the process to try and figure out what's really going on behind the scenes.